Well, good morning. It's Sunday and it's such a joy to be with you. And as you know now, I've developed a bit of a pattern that on Sundays I have a slightly longer time with you where I really try and give you a prophetic overview of where, what I feel God is challenging us with, of what our perception should be and what our challenges are. And so today I just want to share the word of God with you. I really have been just all week incubating, saying, God, what is going on? What is happening? And I do believe I have a word for you. And I suppose if I have a title, it is this. Wait, you need power. Wait, you need power. I don't know if you're a bit like me, but I have got a little bit bored of watching the news all the time. I found it a bit overwhelming. But every now and then I put it on and in the back of my head is this thought, when are we going to be allowed out? We've been in lockdown now for five weeks in the UK and we're just about to enter our sixth week and so you begin to hear the rumours, maybe schools will start and then they say no, schools are not planning, maybe this will happen, maybe that will happen and everyone's speculating, the papers are speculating online and you're never quite sure what's real news, fake news and so you listen and think no, it goes on, it goes on. And I think, well, we're certainly going on until the 7th of May and then they'll review it. And there's this, are we out? Are we in? And I was just reflecting that that's what's going on in our natural world. And then I was thinking about just our spiritual calendar. We've just had Easter Sunday. He is risen. He's out of the grave. And then he's ascended to the right hand. And the disciples have been through a strange time. It's like, yay! He's alive, he's risen, God is with us. And then he sits with them and said, I'm going home. And um, you know, I've been talking to you for quite a long time that I will return to my father and I'll send the Holy Spirit, and, but I'm going. And so one minute it's like, yes, he's risen. Next minute is, oh, he's gone. But before he goes, he gives them this instruction. And I want to read from Luke 24, verse 49 and this is what I felt God wants us to hear in the spirit in these days Luke 24 verse 49 he said I am going to send you what your father has promised but stay or wait in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high but you wait stay in the city until you have been clothed with power and on high and I believe that we are living in that pause season where it's like life has just pressed pause I'm sure like me you've been looking at some of the different news things and my daughter lives in Australia in Melbourne and we were looking at Adelaide one of the cities of Victoria Australia and the kangaroos have decided the people have all left and so they've started to hop merrily up and down the high street of Adelaide and then there was another clip of all the mountain goats taking over one of the um, town centres in Wales and all the wildlife has said oh where have all the humans gone yay we can have our life back and we're in this very strange season wait in the city until you've been clothed with power and so I just felt as I was praying, God, what do you want me to do? What should we be doing? What you should be? What should we be planning? Where should we be going? I just felt the Holy Spirit really say, come on, Rachel, listen to me. Wait. I've got something I want to do in this time. Don't get agitated and trying to get out of jail. But wait, I want to clothe you with power. Many of you know that I had a wonderful chocolate Labrador dog Dibley his name was and I loved him and I remember when he was a young puppy I was determined to train this dog to be very obedient and one of the things that Labradors are notorious for is they love to steal food and so I trained him as a puppy I put food down wait wait and he'll be sitting there and you could feel him trembling with expectation he knew that treat on the floor would be his but he knew that he'd better wait. And I trained him in all sorts of things. I trained him so that even when I wasn't looking, because often you put out food, you turn your back and the dog thinks, right, I can take it. 
but I trained him and said, Dibley, wait. And then I'd walk off and think, and if he took it, Dibley, why did you touch that food? And he would be, oh, mummy saw, and he'd scoop back to where I, he knew I'd told him to wait, wait, wait. And actually he was the most incredible dog. We could always put food out for him and he wouldn't steal it. He learned the lesson of wait. And I was thinking and exploring, just looking at, what does this word wait that Jesus used? Wait, stay in the city until you're clothed with power. So what is this season? And I believe just like my Dibley, there is a training in the waiting. But there are two emotions that are going on in the waiting. When you examine that word, stay in the city or wait in the city, it carries two um, thoughts in it. Firstly, it is that waiting of expectation, just like my dog trembling. He knew if he waited, he would get that treat. And I believe God is wanting us to wait with a sense of hope and expectation. I hope you've enjoyed what we've done this last week. We were looking at how we keep our vision on that supernatural harvest, that even when we're being trained and pruned, there is a supernatural harvest for us and that hope and expectation that God is giving us those little keys to the doors of hope. And so God is saying, wait, but not with a distracted, disengaged, oh, whatever will be, well, I've ordered it, I'll see when it comes. No, it needs to be an engaged, focused, intentional waiting with expectation. Just like a, a mum that's pregnant, she's having to wait. She, you know you've got a time. She's got a time when everything's going to change, but there isn't anything you can do to move the time schedule. You're having to wait in a season for something you want that you know will come, but you can't alter the time. So you just wait because you know there is a time of appointment. And so God would say to you, just wait. Wait with a healthy expectation, not an agitation, knowing God set a time for you. There is a time that everything will come to be. Wait, imagine, dream, expect, because your time is coming. The second sense of this wait is wait with preparation. Again, with my dog. I was actually telling him to wait, not just for waiting, but I was trying to prepare and school and skill in him a whole understanding of the waiting process that would mean that he would be properly trained for when I've got grandkids and food around and he wouldn't take it. There was a waiting which was preparing him. And I believe in the same sense, God wants us to wait because he's preparing us. And so I was asking God, well, what? What are, you, what are you doing? What is the preparation in this waiting? How should we steward it? In fact, I was on one of these Skype calls um, to a whole um, group of church leaders that we work with in Norway. And one of the young men asked me, he said, we're waiting so much. How should we prepare? We have this sense that the harvest is coming. What should we be doing? I want to be proactive. I want to be strategic. I want to get it done. You know, what should I be doing? And I was just about to answer him and I felt the Holy Spirit say this. He said, Rachel, this is not a planning time of strategy and administration. This is a preparation time of your hearts and relationship. I want you to wait and let me deal with your hearts, really dig deep, prepare your hearts and prepare your relationships for a whole new season. And we know that when the disciples came out of that upper room, because they went into a room and they waited, they did come out different. We read in Acts chapter 2, 11, that Peter stood up with the 11. It says in scripture that they were of one heart, in one place, and of one accord. That one accord is a beautiful um, word in the Greek. It's that symphonia it is that actual playing together of the same script it is like an orchestral piece that everyone understood their part and place and sound and they they came together in the symphonia that God is doing something in pulling us together to have that one sound but we also can read from those early chapters of the Acts of the Apostles that they waited they were prepared relationally, they stood up well together, but suddenly 
life changed. They had never been this way before. They had walked with Jesus in Jerusalem. They had healed the old people, but they hadn't seen 3,000 coming, 5,000 coming. They hadn't seen this incredible harvest. And by Acts chapter 6, they're overwhelmed and they have to have a special meeting. And they sit around that table and they say, what are we going to do? We've got no time to prepare. We're neglecting the widows. We can't do all the food banks and the social action. We just have got so much going on in the community. What are we going to do? But they had learnt not to fight against each other. They came together with the Holy Spirit and prayed. And they got strategy. And they set up deacons, etc., etc. And those who would wait on tables and do the social action side and those who would minister the word. And they got a strategy. And I felt God say this, that if we will take the time to wait on him with that expectation for the harvest and a prepared heart in our relationships and not over administrate and over strategize, then he is going to give us the keys to the kingdom that will help us come out of this time with power from on high, but getting the job done. You know, I've, I've had to really consider my life, I'm sure like you, we can do a million Zoom calls. And I was trying to plan the future, talking with people, with prayer people, prophetic people. How do we plan for what's ahead? How do we position the prayer teams? What should we be doing? And... I got to a place, I think the first, second week, where I was in Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call. And I just felt God say to me, Rachel, wait. You've never been this before, way before. You don't really know what you're planning for. Wait on me. Wait and hear me. And I am then going to anoint you with power. There will come a time when you're released from that room and you'll be back on the streets and you will have learned something. And I will then skill you in all the practical details. I don't know about you, but I feel I desperately need to ask God for help. God, will you put a new mantle upon me? I have a sense and I have preached it. And those of you who would have heard me preach earlier in the year, I've picked up that Isaiah 43 verse 18 and 19. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Don't you see it? No, God, I didn't see it. I didn't see what this new meant. But you did give me that phrase, new means new. And I am more and more understanding that I cannot rely on my old ways. That I've got to forget my old patterns, ways of working, ways of sculpturing church. I mean, my life is totally different. I should be traveling, traveling, traveling. I've hardly done 50 miles in my car. My life has totally changed in six weeks. I've had to learn. New really does mean new. And that means new ways of sculpturing my life, processing my life, routines in my life, digging into the word in my life. What does this new season look like? New means new. You see, God has got a new mantle for you. I really want to prophesy that. God's got a new mantle for you in this new day. If we will wait, he will clothe us with power. New revelation. And God is asking us to live in a whole new dependency on him. Because we really don't know what we're doing. We really don't understand what the season ahead of us looks like. And so we need to wait and learn. The new thing. God said in that scripture that I preached in the beginning of the year, behold, I've already begun. Can you see it? And the answer is no. So we need to sit with God and learn. You see, one of the interesting things is when you're in this waiting season, when you're in the wilderness season, it's a very high dependency season. It's you have to walk really close with God. You have to walk in step. Remember the children in the wilderness. You see, they could not feed themselves. They were not self-sufficient. Every day they had to wait for some fresh bread and some manna. And they could only collect it every day. It was dependent. You will eat my word and I will have fresh word for you every day. I will send the quail for you every day. I will strengthen your clothes so that they do not wear out. I will put the cloud over you in the day and a fire by night. You see, God provided every single need for them. Practical needs, clothing needs, food, 
protection. The cloud by day, fire by night. He did it moment by moment, day by day. But they had to learn. And I know in my life, I'm having to learn to lean into a whole new dependency in God. I want to say this, that I have found that God is so faithful. If you look around and you watch, look at me, my flowers. As many of you know, my dear father died um, two weeks now. And um, I have just been so blessed with flowers. And if you know me well, flowers are my love language. It's like my manner day by day. God has not forgotten me. He's just given me the beauty of flowers. That even in this season when I can't go out very much, flowers have always been in my house. And again and again, and I want to thank so many of you, so generous with your encouragement, with your letters, with your cards, and with your finance. Many of you have just felt, actually, heart cries locked down, but we'll just send you a gift. And it's like God's consent, manna from heaven. You know, we've paid every bill. God has been so faithful and everything we've needed to do, I can do on time as I always did. I haven't had to put things on furlough. God has more than supplied my needs, but I've had to wait and learn a whole different dependency. We see that with Jesus right at the beginning of his ministry in the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6. He said, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. Don't get consumed by what am I going to eat, what am I going to drink, what am I going to wear. He says, don't worry about your clothes. Look at the fields. I mean, it's springtime here in the UK. We've got all the bluebell woods. I mean, stunningly beautiful. He said, can't you see the beauty of the fields? Even Solomon in all his glory wasn't dressed as well as this. He said, if I can take care of the fields and the flowers, don't you think I can take care of you? Don't let your faith, your belief system in the goodness of God be downsized. He said, come on. So don't go around worrying. What should I eat? What should I do? What's the ministry? How are we going to supply? Don't have the worry language. He said, that's the language of the pagans. But I want you to understand the language of your heavenly father. It says, for seek first the kingdom of heaven. Everything else will come to you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough cares of itself. And today has its trouble of its own. In other words, let's come right down to a daily dependency on the goodness of God. Wait and I will give you power. You see, even when we're thinking about the kingdom, God just says, I want you to have a day by day dependency on me. I want you to live one step at a time. I want you to wait for this power. I know that I need powerful revelation. I need, no, I need a powerful new mantle. I know that God needs to deposit something on me. And I believe he's going to do it. I want to just finish with this thought of the glory of God. I touched it a few weeks ago. But it is that story in 1 Samuel chapter 6 of David with the Ark of the Covenant. David so wanted to steward the glory of God into his city, Jerusalem. And he planned it all. He did all his plans and strategies. And I believe he could, we could spend a lot of time planning and strategizing and getting it wrong. It isn't the way God wants to bring the glory to the city. And he puts the Ark on the cart. He takes it into Jerusalem and the wheels fall off and Uzzah goes to touch it. And he dies and suddenly there's death in the city instead of glory. And David just backs off and we read in verse 9. And David was afraid and said, how can the Ark of the Covenant ever come to me? And he was not willing to take the Ark to the city any longer. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Eden, the Gittite. And the, and the Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Eden for three months and the Lord blessed him and his entire household and then David said wow the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Eden and everything he has because of the ark of the Lord and then David went down to bring the ark from the house of Obed-Eden to the city of Jerusalem. You see there was a lockdown with the presence of God and Obed-Eden made a place and here was Uzzah who had died getting too close to the ark. But Obed in Eden, a Gittite, he wasn't a Levite priest, welcomed the ark 
into his house for three months and something changed in that household. Something so profoundly changed that it made a way and helped David understand how to bring the glory of God into the city. Will you wait for that new mantle, that new power, that new strategy, that new thinking? Because I really do believe God wants to skill us to carry the glory of God into our streets. But we need to be patient first, just like my dog, Dibley, wait, go. And then we will be ready to go into our communities, carrying the power of the glory of God. And so, as we then go forward into this next month of May, we are in the calendar between Resurrection Sunday, the Ascension, and Pentecost Sunday is the 31st of May. So right through this month of May, Helen and I want to commit to keep doing a message of hope every morning, standing on the word every lunchtime. Gordon will do Saturdays for us and just give us the big picture of what God is doing in the world. But we want to concentrate on waiting for the power of God to come upon us. I want to look at this person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said again and again to his disciples, when I go, the Holy Spirit will come. And maybe we've forgotten a little bit of how to welcome the Holy Spirit into our day by day, every life. But I hope to unpack some of that and encourage us. But let's come and pray. Right now, wait. Father, we want to learn how to wait with eager expectation and correct preparation. Will you come? I pray for each of us who take off the stress, the agitation, the over anxious planning and strategizing. And I pray that we will be able to wait in a right dependency on the goodness of God who will give us manna every day. You've got something good for us every day. And God, I feel you've just slowed the whole pace of life down and you've said to us, one day at a time, wait, wait. You don't know the ways. You've never walked this way before. You don't really know what you're doing. Just wait and I will endue you with power. And then when I send you out, it will be you. Behold, I do all things new. And maybe for some of you, you just need to wait for God to come into your life in a whole new way. I want to pray for you. Maybe you've, got, you've just pushed God right out to the edges of your life. But today is your day to welcome him right back. So let me pray for you. If this is your prayer and your heart cry, wherever you're listening to, if you pray this prayer, Jesus will come close to you. And as you wait for him, he will help you live your life one step at a time. And if you just listen with us over the next weeks, we're going to talk to you about how to live a supernatural life with the Spirit of God so that you can do what you know you were made to do. So pray this prayer with me. Father, today, I want to give you my life. I've been so busy doing so many things and I've got overwhelmed. But today, God, I want to stop. I want to welcome you. Come into my life and fill me, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God really bless you. It's my joy and privilege to share the word with you. So remember, say to someone, let's wait and be filled with power. God really bless you.